Hi, and welcome to this quick take. Exciting, exciting stuff. So um, if you've gone back through the library, uh, you might have seen some Federal Reserve announcements, uh, proclamations, notifications, notices, if you will, uh, supervision and regulation letters going as far back as January, sort of in the wake of the FTX collapse and some of the other happenings in the crypto space uh, regarding the Federal Reserve, the OCC, and the FDIC C's opinion on the ability of nationally chartered banks to handle uh, blockchain and digital assets and cryptocurrencies. Um, and in fact, technologies in general that uh, came along with quote unquote novel uh, concepts were all now squarely on the radar of these large Super, supervisory and regulatory entities uh, without a lot of clarity as to what they were going to do to enhance monitoring and control, uh, just more or less letting the public know that, hey, you're on notice, banks, especially nationally chartered banks, um, that we, the federal government, don't believe that necessary that um, the proper framework for offering safe and sound banking uh, of these types of assets and using these technologies existed, uh, and so fair warning, tread lightly. Well, a little bit more clarity came out uh, in the past couple of weeks. We're talking early August, uh, late July from uh, the Fed specifically about uh, their role in these uh, novel concepts. And there's two things in particular that they released uh, supervision and regulatory letters on. One, SR 237, Creation of Novel Activities Supervision Program, which we're going to run through. It's only a couple of pages. Um, talks about this new program they're launching to basically investigate and monitor and provide approval authority, etc. Uh, for banks to engage in this activity. And second, and this is the one that's a little spicy, is the supervision and regulation letter 23-8 having to do with state member banks seeking to engage in certain activities involving dollar tokens. So much narrower focus, focusing on state member entities and also um, dollar tokens, which elsewhere is already being referred to, at least in those House of uh, Representative bills as uh, permissible payment stable coins. I guess the Fed maybe pushed this out before they decided to adopt that language. So uh, again, let's just kind of keep it to a quick take. I'm Howard Krieger. Uh, the opinions in this video, regardless of my background uh, behind me or the title card, are my own and not to be affiliated with any company that I am associated with. You can find me on LinkedIn, Howard J. Krieger. Uh, and if you like what you see here, like and subscribe to this channel. Um, I have to follow back up on some of the other large body uh, bills in flight uh, that we went over, but this is a quick hit. This is this is 10 pages at most. So without further ado, let me go ahead and share my screen and uh, we can get a little silly. So doo -doo -doo, share the screen. Here it is. Boom. Okay. I went through ahead. Oh, uh, disclaimer, not a lawyer. I am not a tax professional. I am just experienced in finance. Uh, and have been, been doing this for a while, as well as blockchain, so um, and dealing with regulatory agencies and what have you. So uh, I'm just kind of an experienced individual. These opinions are my own. Uh, do your own research, not investment advice. So 23-7, I've gone through and I've already highlighted some of the key words. I'm going to get my trusty uh, dandy pen here. Remember picture pages uh, with Bill Cosby where he draw things like doo -doo 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 -doo, make the little noises. So there you go. So there's a little happy face for your day. Hope you enjoy your week. So SR, Supervisory and Regulatory Letter 23 for the year, number dash seven, number seven, creation of novel activities. Applicability, this letter pertains to all banking organizations supervised by the Fed, including those with 10 billion or less in consolidated assets. So if you're a bank in the US, this letter applies to you. The Fed Reserve has established a novel activity supervision program, kind of a little bit of a 1984 speak, but you know, no matter what they put out there, we would feel this way, right? To enhance the supervision of novel activities conducted by banking activities. The program is focusing on novel activities, and this is really, I'll say this in every one of these videos, 
words matter and the order of the words matter. So even though they're calling it Novel Activities Supervision Program, um, let's not you know dance around the facts here. It's related to crypto assets, DLT, and then third, complex technology-driven partnerships with non-banks to deliver financial services to customers. I don't want to lose sight of this. Um, even though it's the third thing, like clearly this program was made because there's a call to action, right? Like, what are you doing, Fed? How are you going to manage banks and crypto? You can't just kind of bury your head in the sand here. So this is the response. They create this program. Um, I question who's going to lead it because, you know, I, I know how these organizations work, brilliant people, but they're overworked, they're overwhelmed, they're already pulled in 10,000 directions, and crypto assets still represent a very small, yet noticeable and growing portion of the banking system's total asset base. So they're putting out this announcement, they're putting resources into actually putting this program out there, um, but it's still, uh, it's still early innings. So they, they're going to put this program together for crypto assets, DLT. But to me, the fact that they're going to provide insight potentially, or they're going to provide oversight, which, and what does oversight mean? It means banks are going to have to do more risk assessments. They're going to have to deal with their supervisor more with, with respect to these relationships. And these are costs. They cost time. They cost energy. They cost resources. The, 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 the supervisors aren't going to let the banks cut corners because it's, it's their us if things go sideways. So the, this supervision around complex technology driven partnerships, which banks have already been doing, you know, hello, Jack Henry, you're not a bank. You're just the backbone of every single bank in the country, basically that they're going to provide oversight into that. And that's, I think, a greater dollar value than the crypto assets and the DLT. Would love to hear your response and thoughts in the comments below. Program will be risk focused. So it's all about risk assessments, who you're dealing with, how you're dealing with them, authentication and verification. Um, if you're interested in that area, there's a bunch of FIFIC rules, F-F-I-E-C rules on technology and risk assessments that's put out by the FDIC. That's the default of all the state chartered banks for the most part. Super interesting stuff. Uh, the program will complement existing processes, right? Well, you hope, right? You hope that this program has a committee whose members are also in charge of the existing risk assessments and supervision. Otherwise, you're going to get turf wars, you're going to get silos, you're going to get confusion, and either the volleyball is going to drop between the two folks and nothing's going to get better, or uh, the banks themselves, especially the ones that are more prudent and risk averse, are going to be left kind of waiting for guidance on, well, who do I answer to? How do I get this approval letter when I have two different organizations now saying they have supervision and control? So obviously financial in, in innovation is something that, that if it benefits the U.S., the U.S. wants to get behind and do. I fully support and believe that. We are a capitalist country. We love the almighty dollar. If there's a true bona fide improvement in the bottom line to the economy and to the consumers that create better products for better needs, I guarantee you the government's behind it. Okay, I'm not a conspiracy theorist in that regard. Um, they, however, acknowledge here in this case, the Fed, that there are novel, novel manifestations of risks. Now, they keep saying novel simply because the bank system is hundreds of years old. These problems are less than a decade old. That's what makes them novel. Um, but a lot of times the technology just creates risks that are just updated versions of, of risks that have existed since time and forgotten. So the there might be unique questions around permissibility that the bank, uh, you know, whether the banks can actually do this stuff. Um, and it may not be sufficiently exist by existing supervisory approaches, which I'd love to talk to the supervisors because I think they would probably argue that the stuff's in place and um, th they're just waiting for the green light to kind of turn up the heat on some of these blockchain DLT and now uh, complex technologically Technolog technological partnership uh, processes. So uh, the novel program, Novel Activities Supervision Program, the NASP, we will call it, and boop, um, will focus on these activities. Now, this is where it's interesting. 
words matter, the orders matter. In the opening paragraph, they started with crypto, then they said DLT, and third was complex technology-driven partnerships. However, when they blow up the bullets, look what they put first, right? Hmm. What this tells me is Joe or Jane Chew and Tobacco typing up this beautiful write-up, um, put these bullet points, and it's getting reviewed, and at some high level, a supervisor, a su someone high up in the Fed is reading the bullets and was like crypto asset related activities. I, I bet it was this. I bet this was first, then, then this was second, and then this was third, and then this last one was fourth, uh, which we'll get into because this fourth one isn't even mentioned above. And someone said, no, 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 no. Put this first. Okay. So this, what this tells you is that if the issue the Fed is really focused on are complex technology driven partnerships well then well that's what it is right this is what their focus is even though they said crypto dlt and then this here they're putting it first and again i think from a dollar standpoint this actually makes more sense that the the greater risk comes from the connectivity between technology providers uh to the banks um as opposed to the crypto itself simply on a market cap basis not to say that this isn't obviously an area of concern as well. And again, this whole organization, this program is really being developed in response to novel relationships that really stem from Silvergate and um, all the other ones, Signature and, and, and the ones that, that fell by the wayside. Then they put in crypto activity, right? So, well, the first thing is eight, you know, programming interfaces like APIs. And I can tell you, having gone through the supervision process, they actually do have a way of making sure that banks have properly risk assessed APIs. So, you know, they're bringing this forward. Maybe it's they're, they're banging the drum a little here. Crypto related activities such as custody. Right. And look at this typo. Come on, guys. You know, I can't believe they've rushed this thing out. Hopefully, maybe it's just in the PDF that got printed out. But you know, like let's you, you knew enough to move the bullets around. Let's make sure that we uh, hit the third grade uh, school teacher test here. Crypto collateralized lending, right? Uh, which is your block fies, your nexos, etc. Uh, and then here it says stablecoin dollar token issuance and distribution, um, which is interesting because when we go into SR uh, twenty three eight, they don't call it stable coins. So that tells me two different parties we're writing this SR with respect to this new program and what we're going to see in 23-8. Then, of course, they, they want to look for distributed ledger technology uh, programs that, that will have a significant impact, such as the issuance of dollar tokens and tokenization. Why they change up the language here, that's some rookie stuff. They really, you know, you got you to gotta sharpen the pencil there, guys. Um, and then the last one is interesting because they don't mention it up top is this program is going to look at where there's a concentration of services uh, to crypto asset related entities and fintechs. So I guess the fintechs here are the ones that they're talking about here with the third party uh, complex technology driven partnerships, but they, they want to make sure that the banking of crypto is being done in a safe and sound manner because there is a there is a huge possibility for money laundering um and just because of the speed that the transactions occur the anonymity not around so much the wallets but just from logging in you know a, a, a customer gets access to a bank account and you know the bank is basically presuming the login is coming from someone if those verification hurdles are hit now you now you're assuming who the entity is that's dealing with the bank there's a certain amount of trust involved even with all of those uh barriers okay um program will work in partnership with existing fed supervising teams and um they will notify in writing those banking organizations who novel activities will be subject to examination so this program is not just going to write up a bunch of rules and policies and procedures and docs. They're going in. They're going in. They're sending in the SWAT team to the bank that they think is triggering these potential risks. And they were going to periodically evaluate and update the program. They're going to engage broadly with external experts, right? So here's your opportunity. You like crypto. Call your local Fed. Throw out your resume. Put your hat in the ring. And maybe they'll call you to help do the review. Um, and then I question is who's going to be the czar, you know? Like this is too much of a lift, especially with that first one on the technology. Because there's already supervisory instructions and rules in place, this whole program has to either be parked 
with a risk assessment person or it needs its own separate czar that then's, then is going to interact with the different areas across um, the different channels of, of the business. And, and I, I just don't know um, if this peg, <coughs> excuse me, is round enough to fit in a square hole. Not discouraging, uh, no intent to discourage banking with certain entities. All right, so coupled with that, right on the heels of it, SR 23-8, supervising non-objection process. What is a supervisory non-objection process for state member banks? So SR 23-8 is the Fed notifying state member banks how they can get non-objection letters to uh, deal with new novel programs, specifically involving dollar tokens. Uh, again, would love to have seen the language uh, kind of tightened up between the two SRs and the consistency we've seen with some of the other uh, regulatory agencies. But, you know, you got to walk before you run, right? So this letter provides a description for how state member banks can engage in basically stable coin uh, programs, uh, you know, on, on their own, right? So this is, I'm a state bank. I want to start playing with stable coins how do I get a non-objection letter from the Fed? Now, the first thing they do here in the background is talk about how this this uh, 27 letter, which there is a quick take on it, um, where they clarify saying that, it's funny, they really simplify it here. That letter says that they do not believe that banks have the ability to properly uh, cope with the risks associated with decentralized assets uh, on public exchanges, of which stable coins all are, for the most part. I can, I can think of maybe two offhand that are private chains uh, for now. And so, and that doesn't mean that the economic interest of those private chains can't be leveraged uh, and used publicly too, but that's, that's another, uh, you know, that, that's someone's doctorate for 2025 to 2027. But here in that, uh, in that 20, January 27th, uh, as a letter, uh, they mentioned that they were limiting state member banks' uh, ability to engage as principal. Basically, what they said is state member banks can only engage as principal in activities that national banks were allowed to do. So regardless of what your state charter said, or regardless of what you felt you were capable of doing because of your licensing, if you're a state member bank, you are capped at the type of novel activity that you can participate in to those that these national banks could do. Oh, and by the way, the national banks can't do any of this stuff, so you're basically capped to do nothing. Um, and there's exceptions, obviously, national banks like Anchorage that have their charter, even though I know the OCC is really choking uh, off a lot of their ability to do um, much more than some basic custody. Uh, and, and we know with Custodia Bank and the lawsuits and we, we like we, we kind of get how the Fed feels about nationally chartered banks and digital assets, um, if not through omission, then by commission. So here they were saying that state member banks um, are limited to what those national banks can do. There's an interpretive letter, 1174, also really good. I'm not sure I've done a quick take on it. If not, I'll circle back to it. But it does recognize the authority of national banks um, to act as principal uh, holding uh, certain dollar tokens, you know, again, provided it's conditional, it's conditioned permissibility uh, that if the bank has, has, has to the satisfaction of its supervisors in the form of a written letter, uh, has in place controls to conduct that activity in a safe and sound manner. So it's kind of like this. The OCC is saying, look, interpretive letter. Yeah, you can use stable coins, but you need a letter from your supervisor who works for the OCC, saying that you have the controls in place to conduct that activity. Oh, and by the way, the OCC doesn't think that you have the controls in place, so there's no letters. Maybe one or two or a handful of them. Like I said, the Anchorage is the big exception. So it's a little bit of a catch-22 because it's the government, and that's kind of what they do. Uh, but they're saying that now the states also, reminder, you fall under that. So a state member bank seeking to engage in those activities permitted it have to also meet the safe and sound manner requirement, meaning that a state member bank should receive written notification of non-objection from the Fed 
before engaging in those activities. So even though you might have a very friendly state regulator that's backed your chartered bank, if you want to engage in this activity, regardless of what your state says, mama bear is saying, you got to get a letter from me saying it's cool. And guess what? I don't really hand those out. So it talks about you have to contact it with the intention and discuss the proposed activity. The, a lot, let, let, let me kind of show you a little bit behind the curtain here. A lot of times in banking and finance, what will happen is an entity will engage in an activity for which it needs a license while the application for the license is in flight. The reason why they do this is one, if you literally waited for the regulatory agency to provide sign off on the activity that could take months, it can take years. Meanwhile, the meter is running. I don't know if the government agencies don't know this or they don't care, but it takes money to run a business. And if you're not generating revenue, then you're just burning capital. And so if you need a license to do an activity, that time frame while you're waiting for them to go through their process uh, is costing you money. And a lot of times it's not that the process is taking a long time because they're doing some in-depth research. I mean, I've seen things where, where the request is a one page email and it takes six months for an email to get a reply that says, looks good. So, you know, they're, they're creating their own problem here. And a lot of times the agency doesn't necessarily care that they're causing irreparable harm to this entity that wants to engage in a safe and sound manner. So if an entity in all likelihood against the opinion of its counsel has in place everything that it put into the application that it thinks it's meeting the safe and soundness guidelines, they're going to wade in. You know, they may not take every customer under the sun. They may deliver on a limited spec basis, but they're going to engage in the activity that if they get caught, right, pow, hand slap, but they have the paperwork to prove that, look, yeah, maybe we, we kind of ran ahead here. We got ahead of our skis. We, we left the gate. But just so you know, this is what we've been doing to meet the safety and soundness requirements. We weren't acting in a, in a manner that was meant to flout the requirement for the license. We just were in a situation where there was a commercial necessity to engage in this business. So we decided to go ahead and, and do it, knowing full well that if quote unquote caught, it would it would bring an issue. And banks engage, banks, entities that, that require licensing engage in this activity all the time. It's, it, it's, a, it's an unfortunate reality, but unless the government became super uber efficient, they're kind of forcing the hand of these commercial interests. But here in this SR 23-8, you notice that they, they use a lot of language. Must notify, bank's intention, proposed activity, understand the proposal has, you know, and look, the control framework that the state member has put in place. So the government even here is saying, look, I'm going to make you build everything, apply for permission, but you better not do anything until I say okay. And there's a heightened monitoring that's going to come along and, you know, sub supervisory review that's going to uh, be sprung as a result of taking on these activities, right? And then you obtain the written notification uh, and you have to check off on all the risks, right? The OFAC, OFAC's the big one, um, and compliance and controls. And then of course, if you're, you know, and this at the end here says that if you are uh, done, you, you know, uh, if you have any questions, reach out to your regulator. All right, so uh, I am going to, stop the sharing. Listen, I want to thank everybody for their time today. Uh, two super important regs that just came out. These aren't bills from Congress. These aren't laws or anything like that. This is real. There's a program in place. We don't know who's running it. We don't know how it's staffed. We don't know where it's housed. We don't know what they've done. We don't know their priorities. There's a lot of information kind of just, you know, leaving you with your head scratched, but they're telling you that someone's on the job uh, and they're going to be supervising those three things crypto at assets at banks, distributed ledger technology and banking software, and then complex 
um, technological technological partnerships that directly affect customers. Again, they switch the order on that. So remember remember the importance there from a market share um, and also from a risk perspective. Uh, in fact, if you are a bank or you're in the banking sector and you are hearing this, then this might be a good time to kind of throw that letter over the fence back to your supervisor and say, hey, what does this mean? Do we still deal with you on this? or do we have to go to someone else? And then on SR 23-8, uh, you're a state member bank. Reminder, it's eight months later after that January memo, you still have to fall under the national charter guidelines if you're gonna play with stable coins. Didn't talk about any other crypto, just talked about stable coins. Again, I'm Howard Krieger. Again, if you like what you saw here, please click like and subscribe. Look forward to your comments and feedback. And if something else interesting comes up, I'll be sure to record it and put another quick take out there for you. Again, until uh, next time, bye-bye.